What we all know is that there are a whole set of different forces at play here, influencing how things might develop over the next couple of years. And those can come together in very different ways to create a range of different possible future worlds for us. Uh, and so the scenario planning technique is a very helpful one in making sense of that. And we've, we've gone for four macro scenarios. We're using a typical driving force model of scenario planning where you try to identify the, the forces that could have the greatest impact and around which there is the most uncertainty. And so we chose, uh, firstly, the evolution of the pandemic as a, a, a fairly obvious um, one, one to, to go with. And secondly, um, and, and a spectrum there of ranging from a poorly contained pandemic through to one where we've got global eradication. Uh, and then the second is the, the actual nature of the recovery from deep and prolonged downturn to a vibrant rebound. So I'll quickly run through the, the names of the scenarios and then we'll, I'll talk in more detail about them and the, and the possible outcomes. So firstly, down in the bottom corner, we have poorly contained deep downturn, which we're calling the long goodbye, uh, where we have global eradication of the pandemic, but uh, still a downturn we call safe but hungry, where we've got a vibrant economic rebound, but the pandemic continues we're calling the VIP economy. And then the situation where we get both an eradication of the pandemic <clears throat> and a vibrant rebound, uh, we're calling that inclusive abundance. So let's talk through those in a little more detail to just give you a, a feel for the kind of texture of the scenario. These, uh, and scenarios, it's very important to emphasize, are not predictions. These are explorations of how all the forces might come together and play out into different storylines. So the first is one we're calling the long goodbye. This is where you know, we don't get rid of the pandemic um, for some time. We probably don't see a, a viable vaccine until early 2022, and maybe only 20% of us are vaccinated globally by the end of that year. So it's a very long and slow and painful uh, degradation of the environment. A lot of old systems and structures start to cl crumble. A lot of nations that were on the brink basically fall over the edge. And uh, we, we see the economy really struggling to pick up anything like any momentum or even get back to flat until around 2022. And in this particular scenario, obviously a second and third wave of infection multiple waves of job losses as people come off furlough and, and release their staff for the first round of that. And then as they go back to work, uh, they restart their businesses. They discover in a lot of cases that the business isn't there for them. So more staff are made redundant, more business closures. And because inevitably people are cutting their costs and their spending budgets, that then plays through into 2021 as well. So it's a, a relatively bleak out, but for professional services, interesting enough, I guess th there's, there's huge opportunities in any downturn. One of them will be around, uh, you know, just dealing with the insolvencies, the failures, and, and the inevitable takeovers and mergers that happen, but also a lot of work around firms reevaluating their property portfolio, strengthening what they do from home and, and the infrastructure to support that. And, uh, a lot of work, I guess, around support services for people who lose their jobs, whether that's trying to find new jobs or counselling services, a range of new professional services emerging as well to deal with a world that's in more of a pandemic. This obviously wouldn't be universal. There's some countries that are already out of this and, and likely to do quite well in the domestic market, although their international trade might suffer. The second scenario is one where we get the second and third waves of the pandemic and really the, the focus goes into putting all our attention on trying to eradicate it, getting global solutions, because this is an aircraft-borne virus. It travels around the world in seat 37C. And so whilst it's there in some countries, it's there everywhere. And what we really need is globally coordinated action to address that. And this is, in this scenario, that's what happens so that we're getting it the hope is that you would have a vaccine that's viable by sometime in 2021 a significant proportion of the population up to 50 percent globally vaccinated by the end of next year uh, and certainly a kind of uh, a slower recovery much slower but a sense that we have a more sustainable and, and viable 
economy on the other side. From professional services perspectives, the interesting thing here is a lot of those services that need to be delivered around delivering testing, delivering vaccines, we've seen Deloitte get involved, we could see a lot more professional services companies get involved. But also a key part of this is that a lot of the developing nations that are having issues today will need a health infrastructure, they'll need a delivery infrastructure, governance infrastructures to make this work. So there could be a lot of work for professional services firms in helping to set that up. The third scenario is one we're calling the VIP economy. Uh, and everyone who sees this says is, that's where we are now. Uh, this is where the pandemic doesn't really get overcome in the short term, but the effort is put into trying to boost the economy. So we've seen the furlough schemes uh, and we'd see more of that, more government stimulus, more, back, more bank lending to try and encourage businesses back, uh, a drive by businesses themselves to, to try and push the economy forward. Um, and what we, we think in this scenario is that you start to see some of the things you're hearing hints of from some governments where they'll effectively operate a segregation within society. They'll, they'll start quarantining and locking down certain areas of, of society where there's higher prevalence uh, of infection, whether that's geographically or in terms of individuals, people being asked to just stay at home if they have a higher risk of infection. And so you start to see a level of social segregation going on. In this environment, it's very likely that those who get the earliest access to testing, to vaccination, are going to be the ones who are seen to be the wealth creators and the people working in those businesses. Uh, in this environment, we can see a boost to startups in new spaces. Uh, a lot of fields of science and technology moving forward. There could be a lot of encouragement to those businesses to get going to create the next wave of jobs. But also, we, we expect to see a lot of bargain hunters here where um, people with the cash are able to go in and acquire businesses that are failing or have failed, but have assets and a client base that others want. And again, there could be a lot of advisory work for professional services here. I'm leaving it to yourselves because you're in such diverse areas to think about you know, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities for you in your particular sector? I'm only giving the odd headline or two. Uh, and then the final scenario um, is one we're calling inclusive abundance. This is where we effectively get that eradication of the pandemic we talked about through globally coordinated action. That sounds easy. Uh, the global financial crisis was resolved, many believe, because we got the G7 and the G20 really coming together to try and pre prevent a, a global meltdown in China lent its support to that. Right now, we don't have the same kind of mechanism, but in this scenario, you'd have to have that and you'd have to have the World Bank, the IMF, uh, the African Union, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the GCC, the European Union, all really working together to say, how do we create a global change agenda that props up the weakest nations, both from a health perspective and from an economic perspective? In this environment, what we see is that governments gradually shifting their uh, furlough schemes and bailout schemes so that with furlough comes the requirement for people to retrain, use some of that time to retrain into new skills. A big focus on the bailouts on firms using that to innovate and focus more on the green recovery agenda. In this scenario as well, we, we can see a lot more focus on encouraging the kind of green new deal initiatives encouraging the new abundance technologies that can spawn the next trillion dollar businesses. Uh, this isn't something like some that Upman's by any means. It, this is not the scenario where everything is perfect. Still a long way to go and a lot of issues, but it's that scenario where we see the most vibrant recovery and certainly turning around next year from a, you know, potentially, you know, what people are expecting is up to 6% decline in the global GDP this year, which, could mask a 10% to 30% decline in individual countries. But next year, the hope is that we're getting back to flat or even slight positive territory on global GDP and then moving to a much more positive GDP in 2022, maybe 4% to 6% global GDP growth. So you've got uh, four different scenarios there. Now, what are some of the things that come out of this? Well, firstly, I think whichever scenario we go through, there's a feeling that the world is now much more aware of how interconnected we are and how we need to put more focus on these challenges because some of them actually drive the conditions for pandemics uh, and um, 
uh, zoonotic diseases to grow. So climate change, there's a, there's a close correlation to, between climate change and, and some of the diseases we see coming through. So the more we can tackle these things and build them into the agenda, this feels like something that's going to be more central to the agenda, whatever scenario we go through. And on the other side, we'll be more focused. And obviously, from a professional service perspective, the question is, how do we embed this in whatever we're doing? Secondly, um, a real sense that wherever we look in the world, whoever's national plan you look at and whoever's recovery agenda you look at, there is a real sense that we need to build up our, our, our investment in exponential science and technology and those technology fields that will drive the next wave of industries. And interesting around that, one of the conversations we're hearing quite strongly is countries saying, look, one of the things we've learned in the downturn or in this pandemic is that we're very exposed to imports, whether it's of science and technology or goods and services, and we need to build more re resilience by developing local capabilities. So one of the things we can see here is that a number of nations will start to accelerate their R&D capability at a local level which creates a lot of global opportunities for both the providers of the IP, but also the professional services firms, helping set up those local development agendas, those local capacity building agendas. And what we see is that the, these areas of science and technology, whether it's vertical farming or artificial intelligence or um, food chain transformation, new health technologies, they're moving at an exponential pace. And there is a real sense that these collectively could take us on a big journey from a, a Star Wars economy where it's around $87 trillion and a feeling that everyone has to fight and kind of win share from their competitors. And it's, you know, winner takes almost all to more of a Star Trek abundance type thinking where these technologies move to almost zero in their price and start to enable abundance in, in, pretty, in, in multiple markets. And you're starting to see that. We, we've been used to abundance in things like the distribution of information. It's been virtually free via the internet. Some of the technologies we're talking about are gonna give us almost free transport with Hyperloop, almost free food with vertical farming, almost free materials production with some of the new materials technologies. Those are gonna lead to very big shifts in the way businesses operate and new business models around that. So there's a, there's a huge opportunity there for professional services firms, both in helping companies develop these science and technology areas, apply them, work out the legalities of them, work out how you roll them out, how you scale them into different industries. So the more nations start to focus on this in their development agenda, the more opportunities we think this creates. And obviously with that is a, is a whole construction opportunity around building the right kinds of facilities to go with each of these types of technologies. One of the things we're seeing already is, is that um, the, the, the pandemic and the, the associated downturn has really accelerated the adoption of artificial intelligence. The, the people in the AI field tend to talk about seven stages of AI from basic expert systems and robotic process automation through to you know, artificial general intelligence at level five, which is where we have AI that's as smart as us, and then super intelligence, which is AI that starts to really think for itself and create things that we can never imagine, through to the singularity where we're all connecting our brains together. What we're seeing is right now a lot of focus on robotic process automation in, in every field. Companies trying to reduce their reliance on humans and saying, can we automate? Uh, but also massive investment going into AGI, particularly from countries like China, where they're saying this is a real opportunity to accelerate the transformation of industries and the creation of new ones through AI. So again, whatever it is your service is, whether it's helping with the development, working out the legality, working out the ethics, or working out the impacts, I would say for every professional services firm, understanding AI, just what it is, where it's going, how it's evolving, and then what it could mean for your, for your own practice but most importantly, how it could impact your client sectors, I think becomes critical. One of the big shifts that we've seen because of uh, coronavirus has been this accelerated push towards contactless. So in every single industry where there is touch from restaurants to airports, uh, we're seeing a shift to saying, how do we create contactless, paperless, digitized experiences? 
So Bangalore Airport is the first to introduce an entirely contactless journey that you see here. Uh, they were thinking that this was two to three years away. But once coronavirus hit in January, they started on this project. And in 60 days, they've been implemented an entirely biometric contactless journey. And I think you'll see this in many, many sectors. Uh, and again, the question is, what opportunities does this create for you uh, in helping your clients think through what this means? What are the legal implications? What are the financial implications? What are the physical design implications for your, for your properties? Where you're moving from having lots of people doing checking or, or client customer interaction to one where it's a seamless, biometric, contactless, paperless journey through whatever it is you offer. Uh, I think one of the most interesting questions now is, and the survey at the beginning showed this, there's a lot of nervousness about going back to work. There's a lot of nervousness about being around our colleagues. Um, and so one of the questions is, how do we adapt professional services to this? The population's in transition. Some people are feeling that they're much more comfortable working from home. Others are saying, no, we want to be back with our colleagues. It, 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 it's a better experience than trying to do everything via video conferencing. But also there's the big issue of how you do training. How do you bring in new graduates and train them in an environment where they're not sitting alongside their colleagues? They can't have those two minute water cooler conversations to deal with an issue. Everything has to be done by video. How do we adapt the model? How do we adapt the service delivery model where we can't be on site as much uh, to, to a world where the population's in transition and, and many people may just be reluctant to fly? One of the areas that we think is going to be most interesting is the way in which technology and insight from the pandemic start to change the way we do things. I think what's become very clear is that many governments really weren't very prepared for this. And almost everything we've had to deal with in the pandemic is something that should have been done through our preparedness exercises. The very little that's come up that was a surprise from preparedness exercises, or if we looked at the preparation that was done in the countries that really got it right. But I think there'll be a huge agenda around governments trying to get better at horizon scanning, scenario planning, risk assessment, contingency planning, regular exercises. In the book, one person talks about the idea of a, a biannual one month uh, pandemic drill where we all lock down for a month. But whatever it is, I think there'll be a lot of advisory work around government, uh, around helping governments and local authorities and government agencies and businesses really get better at this. We've seen the growth in digital communication that's only likely to grow and the functionality of that's likely to grow. I think we're going to see a lot more around governments trying to digitize their uh, governance processes, trying to do more engagement, using this as an opportunity over the next couple of years to bring citizens in more. And one of the most exciting things we've seen really come to the fore in the pandemic is the use of more interesting tools to create dialogue, to help people have the kind of discussions they might have had in a physical meeting or, work, uh, or, or workshop, trying to recreate those online so that you can have a, a wide ranging exchange of views. You can learn about different perspectives in the room. You can build dialogue, build understanding, and get to a greater consensus or agreement or an agreed way forward. Uh, so some very interesting, largely AI based tools coming through but you could easily see professional services firms putting more of an investment into understanding these and then using them with their clients in new ways to create new service offerings. Uh, clearly, a lot of work going to go into reimagining education. We've seen this big split between those who have technology and can carry on being educated at home and those that don't. I think this is going to drive a lot of change in, in the way we design education agendas but also the way we provision technology to every child. And again, I think this creates very interesting opportunities for those that are involved in that kind of space and in helping find the, the, the deals, the partnerships, the sponsorship arrangements that can help put hands, technology in the hands of every child rather than those whose parents can afford it. Also, what we've seen, you know, rising a lot of conversations about, well, what's the future of business? What's the purpose of business? is this the beginning of the end of late stage capitalism? And I think there's going to be a lot more soul searching in business about what's our purpose? How do we make sure we're delivering on people, planet, um, purpose and prosperity? And um, a lot of questions being asked about how do we make sure we're being good corporate citizens? So I think 
there'll be a lot of that focus, but also, as you saw from Richard's uh, survey, a lot of questions about, well, what is, you know, what is the business of professional services going forward? What's our strategy? What's our business model? What new ways of delivery do we have? What, what opportunities open up under these different, different scenarios, but what doors start to get closed? And how do we learn to operate in a, in a, in a changing and, and rapidly changing world? And I think what that, that tells us is that not only is every business on the planet having to let go of familiar dance routines that they used to deal with any situation and having to learn new ones, but I think for us as professional services firms, there's two levels of this. One is helping our clients learn those new dance routines and learn to, to fail you know, fast and, and not be embarrassed about trying something that didn't work and be willing to experiment, but also for ourselves having to let go of the familiar to, in order to start embracing new ways of thinking, new ways of working, new business models, new, new approaches to experimentation, and new kinds of relationships to take us to market. So that's a